So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start actually with, um, uh, well, talking in rather general terms, right, about why we might want to think about China uh, when thinking about global environmental sustainability. So very, start very broadly, and then I'll, I'll get into some specifics about uh, global climate change in particular, uh, how China is contributing to global climate change, uh, what it's trying to do about that. Um, from there, I want to move to the national or domestic level and talk about some really well-known kind of uh, statistics. Um, I will throw a lot of statistics and facts at you about um, kind of the brown issues, the pollution issues that face China, uh, many of which are, are frequently in the reporting, right, in the news when we, when we hear about China, um, and some of the reasons why, even though there's recognition about those problems within China, why they're so difficult to resolve. From there, I think uh, I, I'll move from pollution issues to more, or brown issues to more green or resource-based issues. Uh, and I want to talk about some of the different um, problems having to do with regions, uh, the Western region in particular, Western resource issues. And to do that, I think it's helpful um, to move away from the idea of China as a single entity, which is how the first part of the talk is really structured, to break open that black box of China and look at you know, the fact that there's really many Chinas, right? that China has a great deal of diversity in terms of culture, in terms of its physical landscape, and so on. So I'll, we'll look a little bit at um, kind of the, the way in which uh, people and resources are distributed across the country uh, to give a sense of some of the challenges that China faces in managing that diversity and also uh, some of the different kinds of issues faced by different uh, regions. Uh, from there, you know, continuing along the theme of kind of resource issues, I'll talk about two uh, gargantuan uh, hydro engineering projects, and those are the Three Gorges Dam, which I'm sure uh, you have all heard a lot about, uh, but also the South-North Water Transfer Project, which is, I think, a little bit less in, in the news uh, reporting about China, but is actually a, an even bigger hydroengineering project. And then I want to spend the last part of the talk turn to the western part of the country in particular, and, and that's where I do my research. And I, I think most of uh, what we hear about China in, in the mainstream uh, press is focused a lot on the eastern half, but I hope to show you in my presentation that it's just as interesting uh, and deserving of our attention, right, to look at the western part of the country. And I also think that there's some valuable uh, teaching uh, tools in thinking about some of the issues in the west, um, in addition to just uh, China-focused um, kind of teaching, I think it's valuable for thinking about environmental issues more generally. Um, and I think this has been particularly true since the year 2000 when this uh, Open Up the West or Shibu Da Kaifa campaign uh, was launched. And, and just briefly, that campaign was designed to reverse years of policy since 1978 that really um, focused investment and favorable policy on the eastern part and let the western part kind of catch up. And that's been accompanied within China by a lot of environmental protection um, policies. Um, but uh, uh, what I'll uh, try to argue is that we should scrutinize uh, those, the, some of the assumptions behind those policies and look at kind of why they've emerged at the same time as this emphasis on in economic development as well. Um, to, to do that, we're going to uh, talk briefly about three uh, major environmental protection projects, and this is why there is an and between environmental de degradation and protection, which I, someone was asking about earlier. Um, and those are the Natural Forest Protection Plan, uh, the Sloping Land Conversion Project, and finally a suite of policies which have been designed to reverse perceived rangeland degradation on the Tibetan Plateau. And again, these, these projects in particular are often taken as, as really hopeful signs, right? Signs that China is finally uh, reversing its direction and becoming an environmental state, a government that kind of integrates environmental logics into its, um, into its management strategies. And I want to argue on the one hand that that's true, right, and that that deserves um, uh, recognition for what it is, but at the same time that there are a number of policies, both social and ecological, that are uh, embedded in, uh, in those uh, in those policies, and that we should look at what the, the unintended consequences are as a result of those um, assumptions, especially for marginalized groups of people. And here I'll be talking about Tibetan uh, herders in particular. The two photos that I have here on the uh, left here, we have um, coal burning along the Yangtze River, kind of representing the brown kind of pollution issues, and then on the right here, some uh, terraced agriculture representing the green resource-based issues, so the two sides of the uh, challenges that I'll be talking about today. First, just, you know, really kind of uh, basic, you know, why, why do we care about China? And again, since you're all here on a Saturday morning, 
I'm sure you already know a lot of these things, but you know, why, why I care about China on uh, thinking about global environment. First, of course, is this very well-known population, um, largest population in the world. Uh, India will, will be catching up with China in the next few decades, but currently China is still um, number one. Um, of course, when we think about environmental impact, it's important not just to think about population, but also about consumption. Um, and here, you know, since, since opening up in reform in 1978, and particularly since uh, the 80s uh, and 90s, uh, the, there's been a growing um, middle class uh, in China that has uh, become quite interested in consuming in, in much the same way that, that we do here in the U.S. So, uh, again, during the Maoist period, um, the economy, uh, there was political isolation, the economy was closed. Uh, after 1978, the uh, country opened to foreign investment. Since then, uh, about $500 billion uh, of foreign investment have, have gone, foreign money have gone into China. Um, and uh, growth in the economy has averaged uh, about 10% every year uh, since the 1990s. Current uh, GDP is about, uh, in real terms, or at the official exchange rate, more than uh, 2.5 trillion US dollars. Uh, in purchasing power parity, it's, it's much higher, it's about 10 trillion. Um, and again, uh, what this means is that there, there is now money in the country for some uh, people to uh, consume resources and goods. So just a couple of um, fun facts about that. The average sales of uh, cell phones right now is about 2 million, uh, two million per month. Um, mm -hmm. Annual growth rate in automobile sales, uh, 40 to 50 percent. China right now has about seven cars for every 1,000 people, which is what the U.S. was uh, at basically around 1915. But the number of cars is growing really rapidly. Uh, it grew from 6 million to 20 million in just six years, between 2000 and 2006. And on average, in just the city of Beijing alone, about 1,000 new cars are sold every day. Those are just the new cars. Right. So, uh, in 2004, Walmart, 80% um, of Walmart suppliers uh, are Chinese, and Walmart imported more than eight, $18 billion uh, worth of Chinese products. So, again, um, I'm sure a familiar fact of China's kind of rise on, on the global stage, right, as, a, as an economic um, and political superpower. Um, one of the major implications of this uh, kind of skyrocketing consumption and uh, economic growth is, of course, energy demand, right? It requires a lot of energy to fuel um, much of what's happening. The other important part of this in terms of thinking about the environment is about 70% of China's energy consumption comes from coal. So it's a very uh, coal-dependent uh, economy. And in, last year, in the last year alone, uh, China added 92 gigawatts of uh, new coal-fired power plants. In terms of how much carbon dioxide it's ad adding, it's 5% of the world total, and it's the same as adding two coal-fired power plants um, per week, right, throughout that year on average. Um, so China is investing in these new energy resources to fuel its economy. It's also, of course, looking to other countries for various types of natural resources, uh, expanding its uh, influence in Asia, but also in Africa, and, and that's been uh, in the news quite a bit. Um, China's economic and political influence in Africa is, is growing. It offers a lot of development aid right, to various countries in Africa, it builds roads, railways, funds textile factories, um, and so on and so forth. And it's willing, it works in, um, and does projects in many countries where other, uh, other countries and multilateral organizations are unwilling to work because of uh, issues of political accountability. Um, China does not impose political conditionalities on a lot of um, these countries, right? It's, it says, you know, we respect the sovereignty of these other countries as a corollary to its own stance about um, not wanting those kinds of conditionalities imposed on it. And so much of the development aid that it does is, is, you know, we give you the money, we give you the infrastructure, and uh, we get certain kinds of deals on the resources. And this is, of course, drawn a lot of fire, particular, uh, particularly in the case of Darfur, right? There's been uh, attempts to link what China's kind of support um, with, uh, with the Olympics, which China has been very um, kind of angry about. On the other hand, the aid has been really welcome in Africa. There was um, a, actually a Time magazine piece this past spring where a journalist um, goes to Angola and interviews a guy who says, you know, thank you God for the Chinese because uh, before the Chinese aid came in there was no work to do and now their economy uh, is doing much better. And again, much of what the reason I'm bringing this up here is that it's um, part of this drive for natural resources, right, that are needed to um, 
drive the economy. So as, as, I, as I dive into all of these uh, problems about China, I think it's always useful to uh, have a comparison. So China and the US, um, so we've seen already here 20% of the world's population uh, versus less than 5%. Uh, China consumes about 7% of the world's output versus about 26% for us. China currently has a substantial trade surplus. Uh, we have a deficit. And uh, China has much less um, arable land available per person. So, so much bigger population, also uh, more topographically varied uh, terrain and not as much arable land. So it has to do a lot more uh, with a lot less in terms of resources. Now I want to turn um, now to first to kind of a, a slightly in-depth look at China and the global scale with a discussion of China's contributions to climate change. So here's just a graph showing carbon dioxide emissions basically from the beginning of industrialization. The pink, are the pink dotted line are the Annex I countries, right, the country, industrialized countries which under Kyoto were required to have binding emissions reductions. In the dotted blue line we have the non-Annex I, all of the developing countries, and then the red line here is China. So a basic point simply that the developing countries began their increase much later. Uh, developed countries are still rising, but a lot of the global increases that are projected are expected to come uh, from the developing countries, of which, of course, China is a very prominent member. Here's a, a diagram that shows, again, just the global picture, um, top 25 countries in the world in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, population, and GDP. And then in the middle, we have the 15 countries which meet the top three in are top in all three categories, and U.S. and China, again, figuring quite prominently in that. So a lot of the debate that we hear, I think here in particular, about climate change is all centered around annual emissions, right? How much uh, carbon dioxide, how much greenhouse gas does that country um, emit per year as, a, as an entity? Um, and here we can see, this was in 2004, and, and things have changed, as I'll get to in a second, but U.S. was the leader at 23% and China at 19%. And of course, it was because of China's annual emissions that uh, partly the US rejected Kyoto, saying, well, you know, they don't make China do anything, so we shouldn't have binding um, uh, limits either. Another way to look at it, though, is, uh, and if you think about kind of how climate change actually works, th it's the cumulative effect of the carbon dioxide, uh, the extra carbon dioxide um, that is emitted into the atmosphere. And if you look at it, the cumulative greenhouse gas emissions since 1850, you get a very different picture, where the US is now at 30%, but China is only at 7%, right? And so this is, again, reflective of the, the history of industrialized countries having that much longer history or time span of emitting these gases. Um, and it's the evaluation of this cumulative emissions that really shapes the stance of, of China, right? It says, you know, let's look at um, what opportunities different countries have had over time. Yet another way to look at uh, greenhouse gas emissions is per capita, so not how much greenhouse gas per person is emitted. And here we get, again see a very different picture. The U.S. at over four times the world average, which is here, and China just under. Now, if we look into the future, again, overall emissions from developing countries are expected to rise. Those from China uh, rise, are rising very fast. Um, but the emissions per capita are still going to remain lower than for developed countries. So China's per capita emissions are expected to more than double by 2025. Uh, they'll be um, slightly higher than the world average at that point, but they'll still, according to projections, be about one quarter of those of the U.S. Right. And again, this is, this is the perspective that uh, China and other developing countries are taking on this problem. Another thing that we can look at in thinking about um, climate change is carbon intensity. That is how much uh, greenhouse gas uh, production goes into every unit of economic growth. Um, and here, China does not uh, look so good. It is the, the highest. Um, it's higher than uh, both uh, developed countries and also um, a little over the, the average for uh, developing countries. Um, so what this means is it's very uh, emissions intensive in terms of its economic growth. Um, this has to do partly with inefficiencies um, in energy production, uh, but a lot has to do with the high reliance again on coal, right, uh, which is, has a very high carbon content. Um, uh, now recently there's been a lot of stuff in the news about when China is going to catch up with the U.S. 
As recently as 2005, the Department of Energy's Energy Information Administration projected that it would take 15 years, right? That it would be sometime in around 2022 that this would happen. Um, but then towards the end of 2006, uh, those projections uh, started to be revised dramatically. They were revised to uh, 2009. They said by 2009, China will be emitting more carbon dioxide, uh, greenhouse gas than the US. Um, and even more recently, um, uh, people said actually it already happened. It happened this uh, past June. Uh, other people have said actually, um, <coughs> not quite in June, but certainly by the end of this year, by the end of 2007, China's uh, greenhouse gas emissions will be higher than those of the US. So the, the thing that, that I'm, I'm trying to emphasize with that last uh, slide is that the relationship between uh, economic growth and energy use, right, the efficiency of that, um, matters a great deal f when we think about kind of the global environment. Um, between 1980 and 2000, China quadrupled uh, its GDP, but it only doubled its energy demand. Um, so that, that actually increasing efficiency over time saved China hundreds of millions of tons of coal combustion and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this light blue line shows what would have happened um, if uh, China's intensity had remained where it was in 1977. Um, so it's, if, if China had not gotten any more efficient, its uh, energy consumption would be about three times what it is today. So it actually, despite you know, that earlier bar graph which showed China being um, still very energy intensive, it's improved a great deal over time. Um, this red line shows uh, that, that energy intensity decreasing over time, but there's a little bump, um, kind of an inflection point here. Um, around 2002, which is, is subtle but has huge implications for, for energy consumption. Um, and again, this, uh, this surge here has to do with, again, the, the speeding up of the, the, the growth of the economy and the increasing number of uh, coal plants that I mentioned uh, earlier, the, the, the figure of two uh, new coal-fired power plants per week in 2006, and that's shown uh, here on this, uh, on this graph. And, and coal plants are significant because they're, they're large investments, um, long-term capital investments, and so they will probably lock in certain emissions for the next few decades. Um, so overall, China's uh, greenhouse gas emissions have grown by about 80% since 1990. Um, but even, again, with all these increases, I think it's important to remember that per capita, um, emissions are still well below, are still below world average, and about a fifth of those um, of the U.S., even as its total, um, as a country, um, its emissions have uh, increased. Uh, this photo um, <laughs> was actually in the New York Times. Um, this, from this past Monday, uh, I guess a man hopped over a security bar uh, barrier in, in the British Museum and tied a surgical mask uh, to one of these uh, terracotta uh, warriors protesting China's pollution problems. And the masks, I don't know if you can see, they say CO2, right? So it's really kind of um, about uh, China's carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and I think, you know, this, bring, this draws attention to some of the problems, but in a way, um, it's important to keep in mind all of the things that China is actually doing right now, right, to try to, to deal with its carbon dioxide emissions. China ratified uh, the Kyoto <laughs> Protocol, of course, uh, because it was not an Annex One country, it did not have uh, binding um, uh, emissions limits for the first commitment period. China participates very actively in the clean development mechanism, which is a mechanism that allows other countries to meet some of its emissions uh, reductions requirements by doing projects in developing countries, either carbon sinks or um, reducing their emissions. And in fact, China accounts for about 40% of all CDM projects to date. And it's done that mainly by being pretty entrepreneurial in terms of developing CDM projects, trying to attract uh, these projects. A lot of the credits come from the destruction of a particular greenhouse gas that's a, a, a very potent byproduct of a refrigerant uh, manufacturer. And so China has uh, played a, a really big role in CDM and uh, has annoyed a lot of smaller and poorer countries in the process who feel that they are not getting uh, the projects that they need. Um, but China is also implementing a wide range of uh, projects um, in it on its own. Um, that, while not necessarily driven only by climate change concerns, are uh, contributing to uh, efforts to uh, reduce emissions. So, for example, in the 11th five-year plan, which is uh, 2006 to 2010, um, there's a, a lot of um, uh, pl 
measures in the plan to improve energy efficiency, uh, plans to retire uh, old power plants, inefficient plants. In terms of transportation, uh, China's fuel economy standards for its rapidly growing fleet of uh, passenger vehicles are actually now more stringent than those of Australia, Canada, California, or the US as a whole. Uh, though they're still less stringent than those for the European Union and Japan. Uh, so these new standards, uh, again, they're only for new passenger vehicles, and so the, uh, most of the cars are old, so they don't necessarily meet these standards. But the new standards um, will be phased in by 2009, and the average fuel economy of these new vehicles is projected to be um, about 36 miles per gallon. There's also attempts to diversify uh, energy sources, to develop renewable energies, um, to invest in clean uh, advanced clean coal technologies. And China also recently came up with its first national assessment of climate change, which was like an IPCC report, but just for, um, just for China. And also in June of this year, um, China unveiled its first national plan for climate change. Um, it says it will reduce energy use by about 20% by 2010. Uh, one official um, statement was that, quote, China's developing country, uh, although we do not have the obligation to cut emissions, it doesn't mean we don't want to shoulder our share of the responsibilities. So again, China's kind of position on this is to emphasize the historical responsibility of developed countries uh, that China has a right to develop, uh, but also to say that it's willing to do its part. And again, this has been critiqued by the US, but of course, uh, at least China has a national plan for climate change, which is uh, not something that we have here. <laughs> so, um, so that you know that that's kind of uh, one example of China um, and its influence at the at the global level. Um, what I want to do next is to turn uh, to the sort of national domestic um, level and look at some of the uh, the problems that China is facing. And again, you know, it's it's well known that um, with China's rapid economic rise. Um, achieving these unprecedented levels of economic growth, it's been accompanied by a lot of social and environmental problems. Socially, we have um, uh, increased income gaps between the urban and the rural with the um, transformation of uh, the economy, the privatization of state-owned enterprises. We have massive layoffs, um, people protesting for that. And then in terms of the environment, I think the, the problems that have received some of the most attention um, are, are air and water pollution. So I'll just run through a few of the, the things that we often hear about air and water pollution in China. So this usually comes in the form of kind of a list of frightening facts, and I'll, I'll just reproduce that here, uh, giving you a list of frightening facts about air pollution. Um, so the World Health Organization uh, in a recent study stated that about seven of the 10 most polluted cities in the world uh, are in China. Um, some other reports say that it's five, some reports say that it's nine. It depends on kind of what you're measuring, right? If it's total suspended particulates or some other measure. More than 500 Chinese cities don't meet World Health Organization standards. This, of course, has led to very high rates of uh, lung cancer and other forms of respiratory disease. Uh, the Ministry of Health recently said that pollution is, has made cancer China's number one leading cause of death. Um, and women in certain industrialized areas of China um, are reported to have the highest rates of lung cancer in the world. Um, and also, according to the World Health Organization, air pollution, they believe that air pollution contributes to about 300,000 deaths uh, across China every year. And again, a lot of this has to do with the combustion of coal. Um, China is the world's largest producer and consumer of coal. It's an, it's an inherently dirty fuel that requires very efficient combustion, advanced levels of uh, emissions control to prevent high levels of air pollution. And so coal is not just a problem in terms of thinking of global climate change, as we saw earlier, but also very much a, a public health a problem within the country. Uh, there's a lot of issues with outdoor air pollution, but there's also quite a lot of uh, indoor air pollution problems uh, from, from burning coal in these kind of inefficient small uh, home stoves. As one example, uh, there was a case in Guizhou province in, in the southwest um, where the local coal contained high concentrations of arsenic and fluoride. Um, because of the damp weather, much like the weather here, um, people couldn't dry their crops outside, so they bring them inside and dry their corn and chili peppers and so forth um, uh, over coal burning uh, heat sources. And because of the content of the local coal, there were a lot of cases of people developing cancerous skin lesions, um, arsenic poisoning and so forth. And then just the more the usual eye problems and respiratory problems with, with burning uh, in kitchens, burning of coal. Uh, for water pollution, if, if anything, it's uh, even, uh, the statistics are even grimmer. 
um, an estimated, according to some figures, about 500 million uh, Chinese citizens, uh, so between half and a third, um, don't have access to safe drinking water. Um, China grades water into five categories, uh, five being uh, the worst, and according to um, some studies, about half of China's major river systems uh, are level four or higher, and so not fit for uh, consumption. So drinking water standards meet, uh, drinking water meets the state standards uh, in only about six out of 27 of China's um, largest cities which use surface uh, level sources, and only four out of 27 um, meet the standards when they use groundwater. Uh, so pollution in both cases. In a lot of cases, municipal wastes are just are not treated and they're dumped into rivers or bays. Um, so in Shanghai, about half of the waste is discharged uh, directly into the Yangtze uh, in the Hangzhou Bay without treatment. In China, also, the water also receives very heavy levels of nitrogen burdens from synthetic fertilizers. China is currently uh, the number one uh, consumer of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer in the world. I mean, so these impose e economic burdens, of course, through uh, declining fish catches, um, lots of health problems uh, associated with cancer and skin disease. Here's a, a photo of, from a village um, which is extracting copper from wire. Uh, they also uh, break apart cathode ray tubes, um, so basically recycling electronic waste, right, which comes from all over. This is, of course, highly toxic. So just another example of some of the kinds of challenges for public health that are uh, being faced. Um, according to some observers, the cost of cleaning up environmental damage um, in China would cancel out its growth rate um, of 8 to 10 percent a year. The current uh, vice minister, one of the vice ministers of the environment, uh, claims that it would be even worse. He said it would, uh, it would cause losses of the economy of about 15 percent of GDP. These, these figures are, of course, really hard to calculate, right? How do you calculate the equivalent cost of disease um, and so forth? But nevertheless, the idea is that environmental pollution, if those costs were truly uh, internalized, would eat uh, very much into China's uh, economic growth. And China is, is well aware of these problems, right? They know that these problems are there. They've been trying various things to resolve them. Um, one of the things that has been talked about a lot recently is to try to make environmental protection um, and, and not just economic growth uh, the, the standards by which officials are judged right, in their performance. Um, but because of the incentive uh, uh, structure, the institutional structures are in place, um, right now solving environmental problems, especially these pollution kinds, um, are, are really difficult even though governments uh, would like to do so. Uh, I want to step back a little bit. Um, and see a little bit more why that's the case. Like why in the face of knowing that these problems exist is it so difficult uh, to enforce uh, these environmental policies which are actually very uh, progressive, very uh, proactive. So first, just in terms of uh, kind of environmental policy in general, like where did it come from in China? Mao famously proclaimed that he wanted one day to look over Tiananmen Square and see smokestacks. Um, right, because this, this meant progress, this meant uh, development. Um, and in, indeed, industrial pollution became serious in, some, uh, in, in many areas while he was in power. China's first pollution control efforts began around 1972 at the time of the UN Conference uh, on the Human Environment in Stockholm. Um, and the first National Environmental Protection Office was established in 1974. Um, but it, wasn't, it didn't really become a basic national policy until uh, 1984, early 80s. Since then, an, uh, more and more uh, kind of environmental laws uh, and regulations have been established, um, and the bureaucratic capacity of uh, environmental protection uh, has, been, has been gradually raised as well. So uh, ne uh, the Na National Environmental Protection Bureau was um, promoted in 1988, and again, it was promoted in 10 years later in 1998. It's now called the uh, State Environmental Protection Agency, and now it has a um, full minister, ministry level. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, today the laws and regulations that govern uh, environmental protection are actually quite, uh, quite strict, uh, but there's, difficulty, there's tremendous difficulties with compliance uh, and enforcement. And a lot of that comes down, uh, um, people have argued, to local protectionism. That is that local government officials protect factories, right, trying to keep them uh, in existence, um, doing things like tipping off factory bosses when, uh, when inspectors are on the way. So people say that when, uh, when clear water is being emitted from a factory, that means that uh, the officials are coming to inspect. You know, so, so why is this the case? Again, I think um, to see why it's worked out the way it is and, and uh, how these kind of institutional structures have hardened into the, this 
the form that they are now. It's, it's, uh, we have to look a little bit at China's government uh, structure. So China basically has a multi-level um, political system, right? There's major territorial uh, units, that is, there's the national government, the provinces, the cities, the counties, uh, townships, and villages. Um, and then there's bureaucratic rank. And uh, territorial units and, administ and administrative units um, have uh, rank equivalency, right? There are certain uh, ranks in one that equal uh, those of the other. So a provincial government is the same as same rank as a ministry. So for example, Sichuan province would have the same rank as uh, the Ministry of uh, Agriculture or something like that. And one of the key rules in, China, in the Chinese system is that units of the same rank cannot issue binding orders to each other, right? So if you are the ministry of something, you cannot issue a binding rule to a province because you are at the same administrative rank. Um, even though it may look like the ministry sits above, of the, above the province, it actually doesn't. So what that means is that even though we often think of uh, China as a, this authoritarian political system, which in many ways it is, there's also a great deal of flexibility and bargaining right, built into this inability to give each other binding orders. What that means is that for environmental protection bureaus, um, there are really two, um, if you're a county environmental protection bureau, for example, you have, there are two people you have to listen to. You have to listen to the, the, uh, the prov provincial environmental protection bureau, uh, the vertical kind of distribution of authority, um, and then you also have to listen to your, your county government. And what's happened is that since economic reform, right, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, there's been um, a devolution of not just political authority, but also fiscal responsibility, right? So as part of the effort to get local areas to innovate um, and to compete, they also have a lot more responsibility for their own fiscal matters. And the, the basic bargain that's been in place is that every level of government uh, grants the level just below it uh, just sufficient flexibility to make the, to have the lower level be able to grow its economy rapidly, right? I enough to maintain social and political stability. So that's basically the incentive that's in, in place. We'll give you uh, flexibility, uh, don't have any major, you know, protests, um, and grow the economy as much as you can. And what that means in practice is that since economic reform, the horizontal uh, linkages have become stronger, right, than, than the vertical ones. Um, so for environmental protection, what it means is that the county government really has more authority over the county environmental protection bureau than does the, the environmental protection um, office at the next rank. Of course, this has a number of, of implications for the ways in which environmental uh, policies are, are enforced uh, or not. Uh, and funding is basically the biggest issue. Uh, and this is especially true at, ta at the township level, which is the lower, lowest level of, kind of official government in China, but it, it extends to counties as well. So basically, rather than receiving regular uh, budgetary allowances um, from higher levels of government, townships uh, have to generate their own operating funds. Right? They have to kind of fund themselves, and they fund themselves through profitable enterprises, in particular uh, township and village enterprises, which have been uh, kind of celebrated as the engine of, of much of China's uh, economic growth, also known for a lot of um, lax pollution standards, uh, a lot of health problems. So basically, if you're, you know, if you're a township government, uh, you, you don't have any money to run the government, and what you need to do to run the government is you need those enterprises, right, to provide you with that, with that revenue. And so this, of course, leads to um, a number of uh, perverse incentives. For example, uh, by law, up to 20% of pollution fees that are levied by environmental protection bureaus um, can be retained to support their own work. Uh, but in practice, again, because of this lack of other kinds of funding, a lot of low-level offices use a far greater percentage um, of those fees to support salaries and other operating expenses. Um, and that creates this incentive to collect fees rather than to shut down the pollution causing uh, enterprises. And so there, there have been cases where um, fines imposed by local environmental protection bureaus on enterprises um, are passed along to the local government, right? And then the local government gives that uh, enterprise a, ta a tax break, ref ref roughly uh, equal to the fine that was uh, levied against it to keep it in operation so that it itself can continue to operate. Um, and so what this does is, it, in many cases, it, it creates the appearance of enforcement, uh, but it doesn't actually do anything to uh, prevent pollution. Another issue that, uh, that I kind of alluded to earlier is that, um, you know, officials basically 
continue to be judged um, by their superiors, largely by their uh, ability to generate economic growth. And people are talking a lot about the fact that we need to um, kind of make environmental protection just as much of a, um, uh, a performance criteria as economic growth. Um, but for now, it's, it's been really difficult to change that, especially given right, the, larger, the larger scale issues of China needing to remain competitive. There's also issues of um, kind of uh, corporatism, local corporatism, where township governments and enterprises seem to be separate, but they're actually kind of like, uh, they're actually kind of like a joint territorial corporation, right, in many cases. Um, the township government is kind of like the corporate headquarters for the enterprises. Um, and what that also means is that the governments um, are kind of competing with neighboring governments on the, on the market, right, to generate income. Um, and so that, that tends to blunt uh, the effectiveness of uh, cooperation across territorial units in terms of environmental pollution. And of course, in a lot of cases, right, pollution flows downstream. They cross political boundaries, but the, the incentives, the financial incentives in place make it difficult for uh, those governments to cooperate with each other. In terms of the kinds of things that might change the situation, I mean, clearly, clearly the funding is an issue. Um, if this, also, if the status of the environmental protection uh, bureaucracy were raised um, kind of throughout the system um, so that they actually have more, uh, more control and don't have to engage in this kind of bargaining, many people have argued that that would help. It's important to realize, I think, um, that at the same time as there are these problems uh, and there are these entrenched interests in place, that people in the government recognize the problems, that they're trying to uh, address them. Um, and at the same time that all that's happening, the flip side is that China now really uh, considers the achievement of um, its aspirations to be a global power to, to require, in part, um, winning recognition for environmental protection, right? So uh, China is now an a very, very active participant in global environmental politics, very different from its stance, certainly, in 1972. Um, it's signed on to more than 20 multilateral environmental agreements. Um, and nature reserves cover, at least on paper, uh, more than 15% of China's total land area. And I think that there's no better example uh, for understanding the ways in which leadership in environmental protection has become important to China's image than the Beijing uh, Olympics. Um, the Olympics, of course, an extremely important source of pride, um, really marking China's entrance into what it sees as its rightful place uh, on the global stage. Um, and Beijing, as part of its bid for the Olympics has promised to make it a green, uh, a green Olympics. Um, here's a, an official statement about this particular logo for the Olympics. Quote, the image represents harmony and unity between human beings and nature. Just like swinging colored strips that encircle and cross each other, the green lines form a luxuriant crown of a tree and recall flowers in full blossom, embodying the sustainable development of nature. <laughs> so according to, uh, according to, um, various figures that have been released. By the time the Olympics uh, take place, Beijing will have, uh, Beijing alone, just the city of Beijing, will have spent about seven billion US dollars on its environmental protection, which is more than the usual national total for air pollution uh, and more than uh, is allocated for cleaning up water pollution in the Yangtze River. Uh, while this is good news for athletes, uh, many have also raised concerns that there may be um, hidden social as well as environmental uh, costs associated with the drive to appear green, right? Uh, and this includes relocation, probable relocation of large segments of the migrant population, just having them leave, uh, the raising of historical residential communities, or hutong, right? F replacement by sort of uh, modern looking housing, housing that is imagined to befit a, co a cosmopolitan kind of a global city. Um, during the Olympic Selection Committee's visit, uh, dry grass was painted green. Um, and there are concerns that you know, the need to ensure a supply of drinking water could also speed up um, other, other projects, especially the South North Water Transfer Project. And with that mention of the South North Water Transfer Project, I want to turn to the second and more kind of resource-based uh, part of my presentation. Um, and I want to do that by looking at, um, looking within China, right, looking at kind of variations within China. Here's just another comparison, right, China and the U.S., uh, pretty similar in, uh, in land area. Similar situation in the mid-latitudes. The southeast of China and uh, southeast part of the U.S. are actually uh, rather similar in, in terms of soil, climate, topography. Um, of course, one big difference is that China has a much more rugged terrain, right, than, uh, than the U.S. Very uneven topography broken up by um, mountains, hills, high plateaus, and so forth. Um, 
Instead of an ocean to the west, of course, as we have here, uh, China has the Tibetan Plateau, which is the, um, in the Himalayas, the highest mountain systems in the world. Uh, the Tibetan Plateau um, is uh, on average over 4,000 meters, 13,000 feet in altitude. And the whole country can be thought of, t uh, topographically speaking, thought of as sort of three steps, right? From uh, the coastal low areas, the middle plains, and then, and then the plateau um, to the west. Here's another image um, that gives you a sense of topography, but also of uh, vegetation um, and rivers and so forth. And this uh, pink line is uh, imaginary, obviously, an imaginary line uh, that <laughs> <laughs> not actually there. It divides uh, China's land area in half, right? So about half of the land area, exactly half of the land area is, is to the west and half to the east. 60% um, of China's mountains are to the west. Um, and much more importantly, 94% of the population lives to the east of the line and only 6% uh, to the west. So you can see that the, the population is very, very unevenly distributed. Um, another uh, way of thinking about that is that to the um, east of the line, the population density is 236 people per square kilometer, and to the west, it's only uh, 11. Um, the Tibetan Plateau uh, uh, covers 23% of China's uh, land area, almost a quarter, but has less than 1% of its population. Um, so if you, if you keep this uh, map in your in your mind for a second. And then we turn to this. This is a, not exactly the map I wanted. This is a linguistic uh, map, and I wanted an ethnic group map, but it's, it's almost the same. So the yellow are the Mandarin-speaking areas. Uh, Xinjiang is very yellow because of, of colonization uh, by Han settlers over time. This uh, green uh, down here, um, uh, Cantonese and other um, southern dialects, but in terms of ethnicity, they're generally thought of as, as Han. What I'm trying to point out is that, aside from this part of, of Xinjiang with all the colonization, it very much uh, mirrors the map that we saw before, right? So a lot of the sparsely populated areas, the areas to the west, are mostly populated by uh, Chinese minorities. Um, and then the, the east, the um, densely populated areas, uh, can think of them as, as uh, more dominated by uh, the Han. China more generally has 56 officially recognized um, ethnic groups or nationalities, uh, 55 minorities uh, in the Han. But, but again, what I wanted to point out here is that when we talk about the West, which is what I will be turning to, it's basically talking also about those areas of China which are populated by minorities. Uh, and then kind of over, over China's history, uh, this, this part of China is often referred to as China proper. I want to turn back to um, another kind of physical uh, geography feature. Just as um, the topography varies a great deal, so does uh, precipitation, climate, um, water distribution. Here you can see that precipitation is highest in the southeast and lowest in the northwest, and so you really have this, this gradient. Generally, very generally speaking, the northern half of China is pretty dry, and, and the southern half is more lush, it's drained by waterways um, and so forth. Uh, summer monsoons uh, usually uh, manage to push their way over the Qinglin Mountains to the north for some modest summer rains. Uh, but in bad years, uh, it doesn't, they don't make it uh, over the mountains. And there's a, the northern part of China often experiences drought, while the southern part often experiences flooding. Uh, the areas north of the Yangtze, which uh, is here, I have about half of China's population, but only 20% of its water resources. So again, there's a very uneven distribution of water uh, versus where po uh, people live. And, uh, and this has, uh, again, um, important environmental and social consequences. One is that in, in terms of average water resources per capita, um, China is only about a quarter of the world's average. So as with arable land, it has to deal with a much smaller amount for each person. And currently about 400 cities suffer from severe water shortages. So there's issues of just the uneven distribution of, of water uh, from the physical nature of the area. Uh, there's also inefficient use of water, inefficient extraction of water for irrigation, um, also for uh, industrial and domestic uses. And so in Beijing, for example, um, water tables have been lowering on average uh, 1.5 to 2 meters per year, right, up to 6 feet uh, per year. I um, mean, so what this does, of course, is it exacerbates water shortages when, when the groundwater goes down. It also lowers water quality um, and uh, uh, leads to sub, uh, 
uh, sinking subsidence. Now, I want to turn uh, briefly to these two major uh, rivers, the Yellow River and the Yangtze River, to think some more about, about water distribution and the environmental problems as well as the attempted solutions to those problems. The Yellow River is uh, the second, um, the one in the north, the second longest river in China. Um, it's often considered the cradle of Chinese civilization. Uh, it's been called China's sorrow because, uh, because of the massive loss of life that has uh, resulted through history as a result of flooding along the Yellow. Um, the reason that it uh, has flooded so much in part is that it flows uh, almost entirely through very arid and semi-arid regions. And it flows quite slowly, so it picks up um, has a high sediment load and it, it has plenty of time to, to leave the deposits along the way and that raises the channel and leads to flooding. It's also changed course uh, many times uh, through its history, the course through which it runs to the sea. You can see those different, uh, some of the different courses here. Historically, flooding has really been the big problem on the uh, Yellow, more on the Yellow River. More recently, it's been drought. And in the summer of 1997, 10 years ago, uh, the Yellow River ran dry for a record of 267 days out of the year. So by the time it reached the sea, all of the withdrawals um, took all uh, of the available water. And this, this running dry happened seven times out of the last 20 years, is not helped by a very kind of inefficient um, agricultural and urban uses as well as um, rapid growth of cities, rapid growth of demand for that water. I just mentioned that it has a very high sediment load, so here's a, here's a photo. Um, it has the highest concentration of sediment of any major river system in the world, um, and it's named in part for that. Uh, here's a few images. In the early part of um, the 20th century, I read that uh, uh, foreigners used to call the Yangtze River the Blue River in contrast to the Yellow, although it's, of course, not very not very blue anymore either. Now the reason why the Yellow River has so much silt um, has to do with erosion from the Lust Plateau, which is the plateau in the middle reaches of uh, the Yellow River uh, here. So it covers parts of uh, uh, Shanxi, Shanxi, uh, Gansu provinces, also Ningxia, and parts of uh, Inner Mongolia. Lust is the name of a, a windblown silt that's been deposited um, by windstorms uh, over the ages. It was once very fertile, uh, easy to farm, um, contributed to the early development of uh, Chinese civilization, uh, but it's also very prone to erosion. So hundreds of years of deforestation, um, lack of erosion control measures, uh, and so forth, have led to these extremely high rates of erosion. And soil loss right now is estimated at about 480 tons per hectare, uh, compared to about 11 tons per hectare here in the US. As with uh, the Dust Bowl here in the US, uh, where erosion had very far away consequences, uh, erosion from China has far away consequences too. Um, these, uh, these images like this gained a bit of notoriety, I think, a few years ago. Um, on the left, we have satellite images of a dust storm blowing across um, the Pacific towards the US. Uh, this is from 2001. Um, in that year, there were these huge dust storms in, in March and April um, that made their way to the western U.S. Here uh, is from March 2002. You can see arid parts of the Les Plateau and the Gobi Desert and then covered by, covered by dust storms. There was a decision in Beijing in, the, uh, in 1994 that required all, you know, the, the government again was concerned um, about this massive wave of urban construction, right, that was, that was uh, eating up a lot of good farmland and so they they uh, said that you know any farmland that's uh, reclaimed for construction should be should be um, offset somewhere else, right? So it sounds like a sounds like a reasonable uh, policy, right? Concerns about feeding China, right? Having enough farmland and so forth. Uh, but what happened was that uh, it was really the fast-growing coastal areas in the southeast, Guangdong, Shandong, Zhejiang. Um, which were losing cropland to urban expansion, but they also had very fertile, uh, very fertile land. Um, and they were paying provinces, poorer provinces in the north, um, Ningxia, Gansu, Inner Mongolia, to, uh, to create new farmland. But of course, the ecological uh, kind of conditions were very different. And in a lot of cases, those areas were not as suited to intensive agriculture. And this actually led to, to further erosion and some exacerbated some of these problems. Turning south to the Yangtze River, which is uh, shown here. Um, Yangtze is the, uh, the longest river in China, the longest in Asia, and actually the third longest in the world after the Nile and the Amazon. Uh, it exceeds the Yellow River in terms of um, drainage uh, 
area and flow. Its, it's average discharge is about 20 times um, that of the yellow, so a lot more water. Uh, it flows abundantly all year uh, round, and it, it carries only about a third as much sediment. Here's a, a picture of the river at uh, Nanjing. And um, the photo here illustrates some of the pollution problems, right? Uh, here we have um, coal black water kind of uh, from the city meeting the, uh, meeting the river. One of the, the, the big problems that has occurred is that about a third of uh, fish species on the Yangtze are believed to be uh, extinct, um, result of pollution and dams, right, both of those things. Uh, among these uh, are the Chinese uh, river dolphin, which is shown here. The, or also called the Yangtze dolphin, um, and it was declared functionally uh, extinct in 2006. The big news uh, on the Yangtze, of course, as you all know, is the, the Three Gorges Dam, um, the largest dam in the world, so I, I felt like I couldn't do a, a presentation about China's environment <laughs> and not talk about it. So I'll talk about it just a little bit. This is a, a, a close-up of, of where the dam uh, is built, and here's a, an artist rendition that was drawn uh, before the dam about what it was going to look like. A system of ship locks, uh, permanent ship locks, uh, is, is, uh, has been built, and uh, it's supposed to eventually allow ocean liners uh, to head upstream to Chongqing, which is 1,500 miles upstream, which is kind of like having ocean liners reach Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, by going up the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. So it's quite a, it's quite a feat. Here's a couple pictures of a by a friend of mine on the right, a couple of uh, photos of the dam while it was being built. These are from 2001, so you get a sense of kind of the, the very massive nature of the dam. Construction began in 1993. Um, basic structural work was done in 2006. There are a few other things, um, generators that have to be installed and so forth, and it will all be done in 2009. Um, a few statistics, 607 feet tall almost one and a half miles wide. The reservoir, which is filling, will eventually rise to have waters 574 feet deep, stretching for 360 miles. So of course this uh, is flooding thousands of villages along the way, and it's displaced an estimated 1.2 or 3 uh, million people. Now the dam was actually first proposed uh, by uh, Sun Yat-sen, known as the father of modern China, um, in the early part of the 20th century, so it's not a new idea. Um, serious planning actually began in the 1930s, um, and towards the end of World War II, the U.S. Um, Bureau of Reclamation's chief engineer, uh, chief design engineer, was actually brought to China to conduct a major study of that. And it was hoped that um, the dam would provide el enough electricity uh, to spur industrial development um, and also provide relief from this long history of devastating flooding on the Yangtze. After the founding of the People's Republic, Mao Zedong also uh, really pushed for the dam. Um, and again, this was, uh, you know, it was a, a significant motivation was not just the electricity and flooding control, although that was important, but also the dam was seen even then very much as a symbol of national pride. And of course, during this time, this was, a, this was the heyday of, of dam building around the world. Uh, the U.S. Was, was the leader of that. Um, uh, Nehru in India said, you know, dams are the, um, the temples of, of the modern nation. Um, and so, you know, China wanted to show that it was modern and it had the technology and could, could do so well, as well. Um, however, a series of uh, debates emerged uh, among the top leadership in China throughout the 1950s. Uh, some leaders opposed it on technical grounds, said it was simply not feasible, and, and argued instead for a series of smaller dams. Others favored the project. Uh, the plans were put on hold uh, during the Great Leap Forward and then the Cultural Revolution, but were revived again after the death of Mao. And Deng Xiaoping became a very enthusiastic supporter of the dam. Uh, in the late 1980s, uh, the government commissioned the Canadian uh, International Development Agency, which concluded that the dam was uh, feasible. Uh, but this, this provoked a, um, an uproar outside of China, as well as a very vocal debate within China, which coincided with the uh, democracy movement. Uh, in 1989, actually, as a result of all of this kind of vocal opposition, uh, the State Council actually agreed to suspend the construction for five years, uh, but this changed after the crackdown on Tiananmen Square. Right, and the dam then got a very strong push from Li Peng, uh, who was premier at the time and who had, of course, also presided over the crackdown on protesters, and it was approved by the state council. Uh, in 1992, the National People's Congress approved the project, although this was also um, unusual because almost a quarter of the members abstained from the, from the vote, which was uh, a surprising amount of uh, dissent, given that the NPC is generally considered just a rubber stamp uh, organization. 
And of course, it is uh, now built. Um, in addition to being the symbol of national pride, uh, it's also important um, in thinking about why the dam got built to realize that many of the recent top leaders in China have disproportionately been um, from the field of energy and electric power. Actually, there are lots and lots of uh, power engineers in the top leadership. And so actually, over time, the electricity sector has, has served um, as a base through which factional maneuvering of elite politics has been carried out. The official cost of the dam is uh, 25 billion uh, US dollars, um, but um, nobody really, of course, knows the, the true figure when you really add everything together. And some people have said that the real cost is more like 50, uh, 50 billion. The major rationales um, for the dam, again, are to control, uh, control floods along the Yangtze, um, improve navigation, uh, clean power generation, right, with all the stuff that we talked about at the beginning, with um, you know, China's co contributions to global climate change. They've argued that they need a, a, a clean source of, of electricity. It's been argued that the, the dam will contribute to the economic development of the region, but actually most of the electricity that's supposed to be generated will be sent to the prosperous coastal regions, of course, rather than the area around which the dam is being built. Um, and actually, power was in, in, in short supply throughout China when the dam first generated electricity in 2003. But by last year, the Three Gorges Power Company was concerned that it might have too much power and not be able to offload the supply, at least for the moment. Um, there are, of course, many, many uh, problems associated with the dam, um, and I'll just talk uh, about a few of them here. One, of course, I, I, as I just mentioned, um, with the dolphin, it, it threatens the habitat, right, for rare and endangered species, including 36 endemic plant species in the river. Um, fish ladders have been built in the dam, but they have not been very successful. Um, there's a lot of controversy over the question of sediment buildup. There are sluice gates, right, that are designed to uh, flush out the silt, but some critics have warned that the technology that's being used is actually not, uh, not proven, not tested, and they believe that the buildup of sediment would, will significantly shorten uh, the lifespan of the dam. Reservoirs, uh, very large reservoirs, of course, alter the local climate, spread diseases like uh, schistosomiasis, which is a uh, snail-borne disease common in stagnant waters. Another concern is that the water which is behind the dam is already very polluted, as we saw earlier. There's problems with pollution. Um, and if current patterns of kind of uh, dumping untreated garbage, sewage, and chemicals aren't changed, it could lead to a public health disaster with the, with the concentration of that uh, in the reservoir rather than flushing them out. Uh, to see. Some critics have also warned that the, that the dam uh, is built on a fault <coughs> and that it could trigger a landslide or an earthquake. In terms of more social problems, of course, there are um, thousands of graves and archaeological sites uh, that are being um, cultural relics and so forth that are being flooded. Um, some were, were excavated, but of course not, not all, and many have said that this is kind of unacceptable. And of course, it led to the displacement um, resettlement of 1.2 or 1.3 million people. Um, some moving to you know, entire towns kind of moved to <coughs> higher areas. Some went to live in urban areas. Um, uh, they receive compensation packages, but there are issues about you know, where the compensation money has gone in some cases. Uh, many have faced uh, difficulty finding work. Um, they're, or they've been moved to much poorer quality land than they had before. Um, so many issues with a uh, much lower quality of, of, of livelihood or ability to generate income uh, compared to before. And there, the, the whole project has really been uh, plagued by uh, corruption scandals um, and poor construction. In 1999, a bridge collapsed uh, and a crack developed in one area of the dam. And in 2000, a number of officials were arrested uh, for extortion and, and kickbacks and embezzling resettlement program money. You know, the, the Three Gorges is, is big and infamous, but China is actually right now uh, in the middle uh, or beginning of constructing an even more massive scheme, right? And that's the South North Water Transfer Project. And this goes back to what I, what I talked about earlier in, in terms of the uneven distribution of water, right? So China has problems with um, basically too much water in the south with flooding and too little water in the north. And so uh, people have looked at this problem and said, well, why don't we just move the water that we have too much of in the south to the north? And that is indeed uh, what is now uh, happening. There will be three uh, routes, right? Three routes, the uh, uh, eastern, central, and western, to move water from the Yangtze River Basin uh, to, or the Yangtze River to three rivers in the north, the Yellow River, the Huaihe, and the uh, Haihe.
Um, and the idea is to, uh, to ensure water supply for farming and industry in the important cities of the north, especially Beijing. And this plan, too, was actually first, uh, it was first thought of by Mao um, 50 years ago, uh, but it only got underway in the 1990s, late 1990s. The eastern route is, uh, is supposed to be, they're just going to use the, a route that's already there, the Grand Canal, uh, which is uh, thousands of years old. Um, this is a picture of the Grand Canal. For the eastern route, the construction is basically um, uh, done. They're, they started cleaning the water of the Green Canal. Um, it's not, it won't be very useful if it's uh, terribly polluted. Um, in 2002, and water is expected to reach Beijing uh, by this route by 2012. There are a lot of technical challenges uh, with all three. Uh, for the eastern route, um, you know, it's studded with pumping stations to pump the, pump the water. Um, and the biggest challenge will be to build a tunnel under the Yellow River. The middle part will require, again, resettlement of several hundred thousand people. Not on the scale of the, of the Three Gorges, but still uh, several hundred uh, thousand. And then the western one, as far as I can tell, the actual construction has not begun, but the government has insisted that it will, it will do it. Um, will be the most difficult because it's really uh, very, very difficult terrain. And this is a, a photo that I took in 2004. This is in the uh, Serta County of Ganzi Prefecture in western Sichuan. And here's some uh, hydro engineers from, uh, from Beijing, a uh, hydrogeologist, who are doing some preliminary survey. And this is one of the areas that they're near where they're planning to pipe water from. So lots and lots of uh, problems and criticisms. Um, of this project, muted within the country, but also uh, people outside. Um, probably the most important is the cost, right? So while um, the official cost of the Three Gorges is 25 billion US dollars, the official estimated cost of this project is about 60 billion uh, US dollars. As with all engineering projects everywhere, right, we can expect the cost to be even uh, higher than that. And many people have argued that it just doesn't make sense to spend that much money, that we could uh, uh, achieve similar effects through efficiency measures that would cost uh, much, much less, and also smaller projects. Also issues with pollution, right? The eastern route already is, is heavily polluted. Uh, if it's, again, if it's just polluted water that's pumped up, it won't be very useful um, <laughs> for drinking. Um, on the other hand, if they manage to only divert clean water, then the water that's left behind will have a greater concentration of, of pollution as well. So that's a, a problem that needs to be uh, dealt with. Uh, massive displacement of people, also, also an issue, of course, as with the, um, the Three Gorges. Uh, there's concern about kind of long-term issues, right, with climate change um, having an effect on uh, glaciers, uh, maybe changing, uh, possibly reducing the amount of water in the Yangtze that could affect um, kind of long-term, you know, taking water from that area. Uh, and then there are issues of water rights of downstream countries, right? So what happens when you take all the water upstream um, and so forth. And, but but d despite uh, some of these issues that have been raised, this project also appears to be going ahead um, at the moment. This uh, website here is actually just um, a website that I use for teaching some water issues in China. It has a really nice interactive map. So two major events uh, related to the two major rivers in the late 1990s really kind of led to this project, right? It was the drought that I talked about, the 1997 drought running dry of the Yellow River, and also flooding along the Yangtze in the 1998 floods uh, destroyed uh, more than three million homes uh, and cost about 17 billion US dollars in economic losses, right? So, and, and this was part of kind of what, what motivated uh, the government to really start this project. Uh, but it, in addition to these water projects, uh, these two events also catalyzed some other environmental projects, the, the kinds that I started talking about at the beginning, in particular those having to do with forests. Uh, and so the government basically recognized that um, years of uh, clear cutting in the upper reaches of the Yangtze probably had something to do uh, with the flooding downstream. And so um, the first uh, major project that was implemented in 2000 is called the Natural Forest Protection Plan, or it's often called the logging ban, which is uh, not exactly accurate, but, but that's how it's often referred to. This was a 10-year plan that, was, uh, that called for rehabilitating state forests by banning commercial logging right, in, all, in all state forest areas. And it was uh, originally applied specifically to the upper reaches of the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers, right, these two. Uh, areas that we've been talking about. Uh, state forests are um, 
basically primary forests, less, less disturbed forest areas. Ownership and use rights lie with the state rather than with the collective. This is a, a map of forest distribution. It kind of looks like China has no forests, which is not really true. But um, so most of, the, most of the state forests are up in uh, the northeast uh, in Tibet and also in Sichuan, uh, Yunnan, that, this area here. Uh, which was the area of, of greatest concern. A lot of the uh, smaller forests uh, tending, tending to be secondary forests in the southeast tend to be co are collective forests, they're collectively owned. So this, uh, this policy was uh, mainly uh, directed at, um, was supposed to be di directed at state-owned forests, which is where most of the large-scale logging had um, occurred. In addition to not having logging in the upper uh, reaches of the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers. It was also supposed to reduce timber output in other state-owned forest areas, um, and it was supposed to accelerate uh, afforestation, civil cultural treatments, and so forth. This is uh, in um, uh, Chamdo of the Tibet Autonomous Region, uh, former forest. Now, this policy has been uh, fairly successful in a lot of ways. The, the amount of logging has really uh, gone down, but there have been problems in some cases with over-enthusiastic uh, implementation. So in Sichuan and Yunnan, most of the, um, Western Sichuan in particular, most of the forests were state forests, but there were collective forests. There were forests that, that uh, villages had use rights to. And the initial policy, again, was only supposed to be in the state forest, but because this policy um, got so much national attention, right, it all of a sudden became a, a huge national priority to, uh, to implement this. Uh, and so enthusiastic officials decided to do it for the collective forest as well. And this uh, was a problem because the, the Chinese constitution guarantees um, collective owners the rights to use their, uh, their collective forests. Um, but in, in, in many cases, people were uh, all of a sudden denied access to those forests and they weren't compensated necessarily for the lack of, of access. And in places where that happened, there was often a reduction in the extent to which communities actually actively managed and took care of the forest. So they actually were, were doing things like uh, patrolling against illegal activities, um, uh, patrolling against watching for uh, fires and so forth. And when there was that shift, when, that, when those rights were taken away from them, they often stopped. And it, in some cases, led to uh, more problems than before. Another unintended consequence, or maybe a consequence that people didn't think that much about, was that since this program has been implemented, um, you know, much of the logging has, it's basically stopped where it was supposed to, but China has dramatically increased its imports of logs from other countries, right? Many of which have unsustainable harvesting practices and, and also illegal logging. So China now accounts for over half of the log exports from Papua New Guinea, Burma, Myanmar, uh, and Indonesia, 40% uh, from Russia, and it also has, uh, this, this policy led to a major increase in exports uh, from a number of countries in East Africa. The other uh, major project that happened at the same time, more or less, as that uh, Natural Forest Protection Plan is called the Sloping Land Conversion Project, uh, also known as Grain for Green. Um, and this project also was focused on the same areas, the upper reaches of the Yangtze and Yellow uh, Rivers. Um, and it calls for the revegetation of 31 million hectares of land um, on steep slopes. Um, and it, what it did it was it promised farmers uh, a certain amount of grain per hectare of uh, slope that they converted from farmland uh, back to uh, forest. And these subsidies were made possible initially because there were grain, national grain surpluses and they were supposed to last from five to eight years. And together, right, between, between this uh, project and the previous one, the government has committed about 20 billion U.S. dollars, uh, making them kind of, as a, as a suite, kind of one of the largest really environmental rehabilitation efforts uh, in the world. But once again, there, there are some problems that have emerged uh, with, with implementation. Um, for one thing, uh, as with many other policies that are implemented, um, it kind of comes down through the system as a series of quotas, right? So you're a local official and you, you get that uh, you have, you know, your quota is 20 hectares or, or whatever uh, that, needs to be, um, that needs to be reforested. And then those quotas are then further divided to, uh, you know, households. And so in a lot of cases, it doesn't actually end up being the steepest land that is, um, Reforested, it's often the land that's closest to the road so that visiting officials can see that uh, land has been uh, reforested. Um, there's also no indication of what farmers are supposed to do after their subsidies end, right? So they have five to eight year subsidies to plant uh, 
to compensate for their lost grain, uh, but they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to log those trees um, afterwards. Um, in some cases, there are uh, they're growing um, economic crops, right, fruit trees and so forth. Um, so they should have something to sell, uh, but not in all cases, right? In, in some cases, they've been asked to uh, where those those species are not appropriate. It's more of just sort of ecological rehabilitation. So there, it's not clear what. Uh, they should uh, do in terms of livelihood. Um, and a lot of these areas, again, where this, uh, where this has been implemented are these upstream areas of the Yangtze and Yellow River where minorities uh, live. Uh, and in particular, this has happened a lot in uh, Tibetan areas. One of the, the points that I'm trying to make here um, is that uh, both of these programs are part of this new suite of environmental projects um, that have emerged with kind of in conjunction with this uh, Open Up the West or Shibu Dakaifa campaign. I guess this is hard to see. It says, uh, stop cutting down the trees and decorate our mountains with green clothes. Keep Kangding as a protected ecological area. This is a sign in, uh, in, uh, in Kangding in, in uh, Ganzi Prefecture of Sichuan. And I just want to speak uh, for just a moment to this Open Up the West campaign, um, Shibu Dakaifa. These are all uh, photos that I took uh, in, in Tibet, near Lhasa, for the most part. Um, so the Shibu Dakaifa campaign was, uh, it, again, it was launched in 1999. Um, and the idea was that since 1978, the, all the preferential policies have really been focused on uh, the eastern part of the country, the coastal areas, attracting foreign investment. It was the whole idea of to get rich is glorious and that some people would get rich uh, and then the, uh, the effects would slowly trickle West. Um, and then, you know, at this point the government said, well, there's now this very large economic disparity between the East and the West, so we are going to start this massive campaign to help the West finally kind of catch up with the East. And this was be to be done in uh, a two-part strategy. The first part of the strategy is investment into infrastructure projects, PetroChina, for example, trying to attract private investment, uh, foreign investment into enterprises linked to the global economy, you know, to do those things for the West, which had, had previously been done uh, for the East. But a second really important part of this project is, again, this was announced at the same time, more or less, as the forest protection plan, the sloping land conversion project, and so on and so forth. And a really important part of uh, the, the discourse around this project has been environmental uh, improvement, environmental protection, ecological construction is the term that's often used. Um, but a lot of observers who have been doing research on this plan have argued that actually what's really done in the process of using language about opening a, up for the market, it's also actually kind of reconsolidated uh, the state con central uh, control over the West um, and try to capture lots of the resources for use by, um, by the East. So an example would be um, the Three Gorges being, you know, its power being sent to the East. There's also a, a project called the West East Electricity Transfer Project. And, and I, would, I would take that a step further and argue that um, if you look at the ways in which economic development and environmental protection are being articulated in this project, you know, as with these, these signs as an example, um, what we see is that the program is really being designed to uh, stabilize the ecology in the western regions to the extent that it can protect the much greater uh, uh, wealth that's already been generated in the East through kind of earlier connections with global capital. And a lot, um, you know, why the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers? Because they're seen as being upstream of those, those important areas downstream. Um, an example is that the, the NFPP uh, was initially not implemented in Tibet, despite um, in, in the Lingjur area of Tibet, the, the richest forest area, which had a lot of logging. Um, and of course, that, that particular watershed, the river, flows into the Brahmaputra, which flows to India rather than to uh, China. Turn now to uh, a case study um, that hopefully will tie, tie some of these things together and look at you know, another example of, of the sort of uh, suite of environmental uh, con ecological construction projects um, and kind of you know, moving down in scale as we've been doing, looking at, at really a regional uh, question. The question I want to talk about is issues of rangeland degradation on the Tibetan Plateau and, um, and what has been proposed about it um, and what is being done and what the effects are. The Tibetan Plateau, as I mentioned, is about 23% uh, of China's land area, only 1% of its population. It basically overlaps with the places that Tibetans have historically and, and currently uh, 
live. And those areas are divided into five provincial level units. And those are the Tibet Autonomous Region, which is the only region that is recognized as Tibet within China, parts of uh, Qinghai Province, uh, Sichuan Province, Gansu Province, and Yunnan Province. And here is a, a different view of the, of the plateau um, from the Tibetan exile perspective of being composed of these, uh, these three provinces of Amdokam and, um, and Utang. Um, and so rangelands account for about 70% of the area of, of the plateau, and uh, the Tibetan plateau accounts for just about half of the total rangelands within China, so, so um, important. And the rangelands of the plateau have a, a tremendous ecological significance if you think about the fact that six of, uh, of Asia's major rivers originate on the Tibetan plateau. So I uh, thought about another way you could say that three billion people, or about half of the planet's population, lives downstream of this uh, plateau. The Tibetan Plateau has one of the most extensive grazing uh, systems in the world. Pastoralism has been a f way of life um, for thousands, a, a form of subsistence for thousands of years. This is a photo of a, a very typical um, yak hair tent, um, still used mostly in, in summer pasture areas. Um, herds are generally composed of uh, combinations of, of yak, sheep, and goat, depending on precipitation and altitude. Traditionally, uh, the grazing practices have um, generally character been characterized by a, a winter home area, home base area, and then seasonal mobility, right? Tracking favorable forage conditions and moving uh, in accordance with that. Groups of, uh, groups of herders have, uh, again, traditionally, uh, before 1950, had a certain delimited grazing territory that was um, theirs to use. Uh, the boundaries were often not marked, uh, but there were defined territories. Uh, but within those territories, it was basically common property, right? People um, had their own herds, but managed the land uh, in common. Now this traditional management system uh, changed, of course, uh, when these areas were violently, violently incorporated into the People's Republic of China. Uh, in the 1950s, they were collectivized, as was land, uh, agricultural land as well across China. Uh, during this period of time, during the, the high kind of Maoist uh, period, 50s, um, 60s, there was a dominant view that grassland uh, was wasteland, right? Officials uh, carried their ideas from eastern farming areas and assumed that all land, uh, the best, most productive use of land was, was kind of intensive farming. Uh, there were attempts to stage a, uh, what's called a war on nature. There were calls to attack the grasslands, uh, make them more productive. And a lot of grassland was, um, was dug up in an attempt to uh, make it farmland in some areas. Uh, there were fences built like this um, that were uh, made of uh, turf. Um, and in many, uh, in many places, wetlands were drained, uh, in a, again, in an attempt to make them more productive. Uh, during this period of time, again, 50s, 60s, 70s, herders were seen as backwards. Um, their lifestyles, be because their lifestyles were, you know, were so different from the ones that were common um, in the East. And, uh, and Chinese policy basically tried to make them more similar uh, to what was seen as the more productive, um, uh, advanced way of using land. And I would argue that a lot of the rangeland degradation that is seen today on the plateau can at least be partly uh, attributed to some of these local things that happened, right? Attempts to convert uh, grassland to farmland, attempts to drain wetland and so forth. But uh, these, hi these historical um, facts get lost in dominant explanations um, uh, of why uh, rangeland is degraded today. So there were, uh, again, uh, in the 50s, um, the land uh, and, and the herds were collectivized, um, put into communes. Uh, in the 80s, communes were disbanded across China, and the livestock were also decollectivized, while the pastures remained held in common by villages. So for a brief period of time, uh, the management of the rangelands was somewhat similar to what had happened uh, before the 50s, insofar as herds were <coughs> privately held, but uh, land was held in common. Soon, however, um, there started to be a concern among um, policymakers in China that herders were not developed enough, that they were backwards. Um, you know, so while they were, while not long ago they had been seen uh, as being backwards for not being adequately socialist, in the 80s they became backwards for not having enough market orientation. Um, there, were also, there was also concern about, uh, about rangeland degradation problems that started to, to occur. And, um, so the new policies that have been implemented since, uh, the 19, since the 1990s has been to divide the grasslands up to individual households, right? Uh, and so the idea is that um, 
is very much a, a tragedy of the commons kind of idea for the ecological part. Uh, the idea was, you know, everyone has their own herds, but they don't have their own land, and so they're not adequately taking, they don't have the incentives to take care of it, so we need to divide the farmland up, uh, the rangeland up much in the same way as uh, farmland is divided up. And it was also said at the same time that if only they would, if only we could divide up the rangeland, um, herders would, would learn uh, to appreciate uh, what it takes to survive in a market economy, basically. And they will have more incentive not only to take care of their land, but also to, um, uh, to get their animals to market um, faster, and they will lift themselves out of poverty uh, in this way. Right. So, so since, the since the 1990s, there's been this effort to, um, to privatize the use rights to the land for herders. Uh, at this, this has also happened at the same time as uh, efforts, um, intensified efforts to sedentarize, to have um, herders stop living in tents, start living in houses, and in some cases to build, to build fences like the ones that you uh, see here. So in short, the, you know, the leasing of grassland use rights to individual households was seen as a way to uh, convert the kind of uh, unproductive, economically destructive, traditional nomadic way of life into an efficient market-oriented market production system. That is sort of, in, in, in short, what these uh, policies are designed to do. But what I want to talk about is the fact that there are a number of ecological and social assumptions that are really built into these policies, which aren't necessarily, uh, have not necessarily been supported by evidence. There's the assumption that, over, that rangelands are uniformly degraded. There's an assumption that uh, overgrazing is the basic problem. And there's an assumption that only by div dividing and fencing rangeland will we solve this problem. This model is one that accepts private property as being the best way to manage all resources. But this is very much the kinds of underpinnings of the policies that are, are currently in place. Uh, but I would argue that this model ignores a number of factors, right? First, it ignores the fact that um, herders have been managing uh, their land as common property for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Uh, it assumes that the grasslands of the Tibetan Plateau uh, behave ecologically speaking the same way as grasslands in uh, other parts of the world, like the U.S. West, behave. Um, it makes an assumption that uh, the ecology of the land is a uh, it's an equilibrium kind of uh, ecological system in which the most important factor dictating how much grass grows is simply how much uh, grazing takes place. However, there, there's evidence from other um, parts of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, that in places where there's very high variability in certain kinds of biophysical uh, factors such as uh, precipitation or temperature, snowfall events, and so forth, that um, grazing may not be as important um, as some of these other factors, and that the most important feature for sustainability is mobility and flexibility, right? The ability to respond to these sort of very localized um, events and these high uh, variation in ecosystem factors. There's also a, a really important question about how much of what is happening is due really to grazing and how much of it is due to global climate change, right? The Tibetan Plateau being a very uh, sensitive area to um, changes, seeing a lot of really dramatic changes that are not necessarily seen um, in other places. And uh, actually, a colleague of mine has done some controlled experiments in, in one part of northeastern, uh, the northeastern part of the plateau. She has these plots where she has um, artificial warming um, of plots, and then she has mimicking grazing, and then she does kind of cross um, experiments. And what she's found is that, at least you know, in, in these experiments, which are the only ones which have been done on the plateau so far, warming has decreased the number of species, it has changed species composition, it decreases the productivity of the land, um, but that this is actually modulated in her experiments by grazing. That is, if you have grazing in, di in addition to warming in this particular system, there's mitigation of that effect to some extent. Right? So in, in particular circumstances, it may be better to have a combination of the two than to have warming alone. So despite the uh, extensive kind of research on some of the social and ecological factors that do lead to the um, conditions that are being seen. This, these policies are being implemented, uh, and, and a number of problems have uh, occurred. One is that in many, many uh, areas, the division hasn't been done with very good equity in terms of water access right, for herders and their livestock. So uh, in some cases, it's, it's just been very difficult, given, again, the variability of the system, the kind of sizes of uh, plots that we're talking about to have everyone have easy access to water. So in many cases, herders now have to um, 
you know, they may not have access to water for their livestock on their own land, so they have to go through other people's uh, land, which provokes conflicts. Um, they spend a lot more time uh, fetching water for their livestock. In one uh, place that I visited in northern Sichuan, it was actually previously a wetland area, but it was drained in the 60s. And then they decided to um, not divide, uh, not give everyone a winter and summer pasture, but just to give everyone one pasture, much like uh, the American ranching model. And so there, people are having to dig wells on their land for water, and that has um, led to, to further difficulties for their livestock. There's also issues in some cases of unfair allocation of rangeland resources, right? In some cases, you know, whoever was best friends with or the relative of the person who did the division got the best land. Um, in other cases, people, you know, tried pretty hard to, to um, have equitable land allocation, but again, because of the patchiness of the system, it, it's just not always possible to give everyone kind of equal access to um, various qualities of land. You know, one of the things that was supposed to happen was that this was supposed to decrease the number of conflicts over boundaries, but in many cases, it's actually increased. People say, you know, uh, before we would fight with our neighboring villages, but now, you know, people within a family fight with each other uh, because of, of these, uh, the, d the way in which land was divided. There is, in some cases, increased labor inputs uh, because, um, you know, herding a whole bunch of animals, there's an economy of, of, uh, of scale or scope there, um, which you lose now that every family is, is herding their own livestock within a certain delimited area of land. So, so it has not actually, in many cases, uh, made people more marketized, you know, going, going out to um, do various kinds of labor because there's actually more, more labor required. Just in general, so far, there doesn't seem to be much evidence of improved range conditions. And in some cases where you know, this is happening together with sedentarization, people are not going as far right, with their livestock. So there's actually more signs of overgrazing in those um, more settled uh, permanent areas. But despite all these problems, the idea that um, privatization will solve the issues is, is quite strong. Um, as uh, privatization together with sedentarization and fencing. Um, and so this process is complete in um, areas of Inner Mongolia, for example, um, the eastern part of the Tibetan Plateau, and it's now really being implemented in the western uh, plateau, the Tibet Autonomous Region, and some of the more remote, sparsely populated areas. At the same time as this is happening, though, there's another rangeland policy that began uh, in 2002 that um, has some of the characteristics of these uh, fencing policies, but also is in some ways quite fundamentally different. And this, this new project is called Converting Pastures to Grasslands. And it was really conceived of originally as sort of the grassland version of the sloping land conversion project. So it, it fits into this sort of new set of ecological construction projects that I've been, I've been talking about as having really um, been important since the Open Up the West campaign. Um, and what this policy does is it says, let's divide, um, let's divide the grasslands of the plateau into three types of zones, right? Uh, there will be the zone where we'll have rotational grazing. Uh, there will be the zone where we will rest the grasslands for five years um, and then let them rehabilitate and then put them back. And then there's the zones where the government says, let's just permanently not have any grazing on it because it's so degraded or it's so ecologically fragile that it's just not suitable uh, for grazing. This new project, um, you know when, when you see the new project because you see these red and white fence posts, which are the, the, um, the uh, symbol of this project. In, in some cases, uh, as with uh, this particular case, this is a, a photo from Western Sichuan province. It's not in one of the areas that the government is currently most concerned about. It's most concerned about an area that's uh, called the, the source of the three rivers, uh, Sanjiangyuan, uh, the source of the, um, the Yellow, the Yangtze, and the Mekong. So in some areas, this, the implementation of this project is much like the implementation of previous projects, where there's a lot of show and not a lot of uh, substance. So in this particular case, uh, you, will, you can you drive along the road and, and see all these fences, but people will tell you that in some areas the fence doesn't actually go all the way around to the other side, right? So, so this, is, this is a fence that is by the road so that people can see that a fence uh, has been built. And it's kind of a problem. People didn't really like these fences because they have to guard the fences, right? Because uh, it would not look very good to have a fence there, uh, to not have the fence there when officials show up to inspect. And so they actually have to spend labor time, right, trying to... Uh, to guard uh, the expenses. But in some cases, they're not having too much of uh, a real effect in terms of rangeland management and livelihoods. But in other areas where there's to be no grazing at all, people are asking, being asked to move off of the land. 
to sell all of their livestock and move um, to towns. This program is the, the last kind that I talked about, right? The zone where there is to be no more um, no more grazing. So it's where this policy meets another effort uh, that's been accelerating across China of ecological migration, right? Of having people migrate or move to other places for ecological reasons. This is uh, in uh, Jiekundo town in, in uh, Yushu province, uh, prefecture of Qinghai. So the main town is sort of uh, off to the left there. And uh, there's a mountain, and then here is a, a brand new settlement that has been built uh, for herders. And the idea is that it's supposed to be good for both the herders and for the environment. They're supposed to sell their livestock and rehabilitate the land by not having any grazing. And then they're supposed to, they're given subsidies to move to towns where, uh, according to this particular uh, view, uh, going to become more modern citizens, right, by, by the fact of living in cities. In this particular case, these herders are supposed to be given uh, subsidies for five years. Um, they're, they're given a house, they're given subsidies, and they're supposed to sell all of their livestock. Uh, here's a close-up of um, the houses that have been built. Um, so the program, uh, the people that I've talked to here said that they, um, they moved voluntarily. There were um, people who actually didn't have that much livestock to start with, so we might ask you know, what, what good this program actually did, if that ecological logic indeed uh, holds true. Um, but, and the government has said, on the one hand, that this should be a voluntary project. On the other hand, it has certain quotas, certain targets to be made. So, you know, how do those two things um, go together? This is a pilot program. It's supposed to be um, expanded in scope. And so, uh, this is still a very new kind of thing, but I think this generates a lot of questions, right? Like, are they really getting the compensation they're supposed to get? What are they supposed to do after the compensation uh, is over? In many cases, they're, they're Tibetan herders. They don't uh, necessarily uh, speak Chinese very well. They don't have the skills to compete in the now really uh, Han-dominated marketplace. Um, what sorts of effects do they have in the town? Um, I, when I was trying to um, get a taxi to take me around, it's a pretty long walk uh, from the main town, to, to come here, nobody wanted to come because uh, the place already has a reputation for people sitting around with nothing to do, and so um, uh, getting in fights all the time. Uh, they, these people uh, asked for uh, an elementary school for their their kids because it's a it's too long of a walk uh, for young children to go to the main town, but they don't have an elementary school right now. Um, so lots of questions about um, about what will happen with these kinds of settlements uh, proliferating. Furthermore, again, there's no good body of evidence to show that this is actually good for the grasslands, right? It may very well be, but simp there, there simply has been no uh, real study that have been done, and in light, especially in light of the climate change, right, that we, that we expect to, uh, be ha to be having an effect uh, on the grassland. So in the end, with certain projects like this one, I think one, we have to wonder you know, whether it's really more effective as an environmental program or as a program to control and modify culture of minority pastoralists, right, who's, uh, who the state often finds kind of difficult to control and somewhat um, inconvenient. As you drive through these um, Tibetan areas, uh, this is in, in western Sichuan province, uh, you see many, lots and lots of house building happening in these pastoral areas. This picture on the left, um, is from uh, Golok in, in Qinghai province. And I think it captures some of the, the change in, in continuity issues uh, for these people in these western parts of um, the country that are being affected by these policies. So you have in the background there this uh, forage, uh, growing forage for, for the winter. Uh, so these people have not been asked to move. Um, and a uh, warm uh, pen for, for livestock during the winter. And also this traditional flag, but people riding uh, motorcycles rather than than horses. And then on the right, this is a photo that I took near the new train station in near Lhasa. And uh, you have on the uh, photograph, uh, protect the environment, love my Tibet. And then you have the actual landscape uh, in the background. Uh, and so in this case, you know, I think this really, um, again, this kind of emphasize, this emphasizes the fact that environmental protection is never just environmental protection, right? It's especially when you're dealing with these areas, these areas of, of China, um, these resource issues, right? In this case, environmental protection is really wrapped up in um, struggles over sovereignty in Tibet in particular. Um, and, and I also wanted to flag the kind of possible contradictions, right, between some of the rhetorics and, and the, the landscapes in which the policies are being enacted. I wanted to, to end on these slides um, 
with a reminder uh, of where I started at the beginning, which is that I think, you know, overall we can say that China is um, a country which is facing some really intensely difficult environmental challenges. Um, many of which will affect the entire world because of the population, the economy, because of where it is, right? We think about where the Tibetan Plateau is, of course. Um, I think it's really important as outside observers to um, give credit for the kinds of improvements that, uh, that are being made, right? And, I'll, and um, to always keep things in comparative perspective. And this is something that when I, when I teach about these issues, I always try to ask my students to think about the, the US, um, and they don't often like that very much. Um, but you know, thinking about, thinking about the US's per capita greenhouse gas emissions in comparison to, to China's and so on and so forth. But I think at the same time that when we think about um, China's environmental solutions, just as we think about them for any country, um, uh, we should think carefully about whether or not they're really supported by social and ecological assumptions, what sorts of distributional impacts that they have, unintended consequences particularly, or intended consequences, but sometimes hidden, for economically and politically marginalized uh, groups of people. And for me, uh, you know, in, in, for, for lessons like that, it's often easier for me to, to, to tell my students about problems in other countries and then have them think about um, our own country. Thank you.